Okay, so continuing with our discussion of uh, airspace disease today, we continue with infections. So we'll start with this case. What is the finding? What's abnormal here? So where, well, you got to do better than on the yeah, left yeah. side. I mean, the left lingula? Well, there, yeah, there's no right lingula, is there? Yeah. So, so your, so your interpretation of this would be? Um, uh, consolidation, flooding the left heart border. All right. So pneumonia of the in the lingula. Yeah. Right. All right. So, what's the most likely cause? Um, strep. Okay. So, uh, for for community acquired pneumonias, right? So strep pneumonia is the most most likely cause. That is that is what we're usually told. So the teaching strep pneumonia is the most common organism for community acquired pneumonias. Uh, so consolidation or lobar consolidation is the classic appearance. So the pathophysiology is that the bacteria are inhaled into the periphery of the lobe and the inflammation spreads around within that lobe. So it tends to be localized to, to a lobe um, rather than spreading to other lobes. So you get a confluent consolidation within the lobe, lobar pneumonia strep pneumonia, the classic organism that causes that. Now, if I tell you this is pneumonia, what, what is unusual about the appearance that you're looking at here? It's got mass effect. Yeah, so there's mass effect, and how do you recognize that? Yeah, the fissure is curved. Yeah, which fissure is that? Or is, that's the major fissure. It's yeah, so there's this right up below consolidation with mass effect on the major fissure here. So what do we call this? So Friedlander's pneumonia and the classic organism that does this is, is Klebsiella, right. So the idea is here we have organisms that cause a lot of inflammation, exuberant consolidation that can result in mass effect, actually an enlargement of the lobe. Of course, you know, other things would be differential tumor, neoplasm, anything that's going to cause mass effect would also be in the differential. But the classic organism for Friedlander's pneumonia is Klebsiella pneumonia. And this is associated with complications. So abscesses, cavities, and pyema is all common, but there are other organisms, other gram-negative uh, virulent types of organisms that can also do this. But that is Friedlander's pneumonia, classically caused by Klebsiella. Now, what's different about, yes? Yeah. Well, generally, what do we look for for necrotizing pneumonia? We look for what? So cavitation, right? So cavitation is what we look for for necrotizing pneumonia. And these types of pneumonias do result in, in those, those kind of complications, like necrotizing pneumonia, cavitation, uh, abscesses, you know, as, as we've said. So for cavitation, for necrotizing pneumonia, we, uh, for necrotizing pneumonia, we want to see cavitation, okay? Sometimes it's hard to tell on the plain film. I mean, it's hard to tell. Are you looking at aerated lung within the consolidation or are you looking at cavitation, right? So that can be very hard to differentiate on the plain film. But you're right, an air fluid level, on the plain film, an air fluid level would indicate cavitation for sure, right? Sure. Now, in this example, what's different? What's different about this pneumonia? Yeah, so this is multi-lobar. So here, it's not just in one lobe, but more so on the right side, but you also have opacities on the left side. So if this is pneumonia, what kind of pneumonia do we call this? Well, multi, but, the, but the term for that, the more fancy term we like to use is, yeah. So, bron so bronchogenic pneumonia, or and don't con don't confuse the term lobular pneumonia as opposed to lobar pneumonia. So bronchogenic pneumonia, and the, and the classic organism as far as the teaching for this is, yes. So here we're dealing with bronchopneumonia. So this is usually spreads through the airways. So and that's why it's in multiple lobes, and it can be bilateral. So usually secondary aspiration and. Uh, the uh, other term for this is lobular pneumonia. Again, don't confuse that with lobar pneumonia. So it spreads via the airways to produce multifocal, ill-defined consolidation. Now, if I tell you this patient has fever and cough, 
when we look at this x-ray, what is different about the appearance here as opposed to the appearance that we've seen in the prior cases? It's ground glass. So here might be ground glass and also what? What else? Anything else as far as the appearance? Yeah, it's reticular, right? So you have these lines in here, right? So this is a more of a reticular pattern in this patient with pneumonia. So there's a term that we use if we're dealing with pneumonia that doesn't look like your typical classic pneumonia where you have airspace disease and consolidations in your bronchograms. And the term we use is atypical, atypical pneumonia. pneumonia, right? So this is called atypical pneumonia. Now the point about atypical pneumonia is that there's certain organisms we're supposed to think about. So what organisms do we think about when we have atypical pneumonia? Viruses. Viruses, right. So certainly viral pneumonias Legionella, although Legionella more often gives you consolidations, but yes, that, that can do that. What else? Mycoplasma. Yeah, mycoplasma. So those are, what was that? Sure, pneumocystis pneumonia, right? And pneumocystis may not be something that, that you know, you may be the first one to consider pneumocystis pneumonia. I mean, they may not know that the patient is HIV positive. So certainly pneumocystis pneumonia is also in your differential for atypical pneumonia, and that was the case here. This was a case of pneumocystis pneumonia. So atypical pneumonias can be from pneumocystis viral mycoplasma, and it gives you more of an acute interstitial pattern. You may have what looks like also ground glass on the chest x-ray. Although ground glass is hard to see on the chest x-ray. It's a term we usually use for a CT appearance, ground glass, okay? Now, mycoplasma pneumonia, this is uh, supposedly the most common non-bacterial pneumonia. The interstitial pattern is classic for mycoplasma, although mycoplasma can give you patchy consolidation. It's probably more likely to give you patchy consolidations than an interstitial pattern. You mentioned Legionella pneumonia. This is another unusual pneumonia you might come across, although there isn't anything really specific as far as the imaging for Legionella pneumonia. So the bacteria grows where there is water and so patients uh, near cooling towers, reservoirs, humidifiers. Uh, there are predisposing chronic diseases like COPD, malignant disease, renal failure, steroid. And this can give patients a severe pneumonia uh, with high fever, productive cough, et cetera. But the appearance is that there's really nothing specific about the radiological uh, appearance. So you can have patchy consolidations, multifocal consolidations, which are common. Some patients can, two-thirds can also have Fusion, so multifocal consolidations like that. But it's not really nothing specific about the radiology appearance. Here's another example where you have pretty extensive uh, widespread pneumonia. Um, and the clearance may be slow, all right? So the resolution, it can take up to one month to clear and lags behind the clinical improvement. Uh, so the, uh, the radiology of the extent of disease doesn't always correlate with, you know, how the patient is doing, especially when they're on treatment. And cavitation is unusual. We usually don't see cavitation with Legionella pneumonia, okay? On this radiograph, what, what is uh, abnormal about this radiograph? What are the findings on this radiograph? So where's the lymphadenopathy? Where on the right side? We can do better than that. Yeah, so we have, we have this kind of notice the left pulmonary artery here, very smooth here, it's kind of lumpy, bumpy. So we have right hilar lymphadenopathy. Where else on the right side? Right paratracheal area here. There's too much, you don't have a good paratracheal line and there's too much density here or opacity. And it's also a little bit lumpy here. So we have right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. We have right hilar lymphadenopathy. Is there another finding also on the chest radiograph? Yeah, so right pleural effusion here. So if you're looking at this chest radiograph for the first time, the first thing you might consider when you see a chest radiograph like this is what? Well, no, we're not necessarily talking about MIME. I'm saying the first time you look at a chest radiograph, if you notice right paratracheal, right fibro lymphadenopathy, right effusion, Answer. Yeah, so malignancy is the first thing that you're going to be thinking about. So what kind of malignancies might do this? Yeah, so lymphoma can give you lymphadenopathy. What else? Mets, Mets from what? Mets from what? 
So what are primary tumors that have a propensity to metastasize to mediastinal and hyaline nodes? What are those tumors? Well, the obvious one is the obvious one is lung cancer, right? Lung. But in the abdomen, what tumor does, likes to do this? Somebody say it. What? Renal cell carcinoma. Renal cell carcinoma. Renal, absolutely. can also metastasize the hyaluronic mediastinal nodes. All right, so malignancy might be the first thing that you're considering when you look at a chest radiograph like this. But of course, you know, the topic of this conference is infection and pneumonia. So the, the infection that we will think about is tuberculosis, right? So tuberculosis can present with the patinopathy or effusion. So as, a, as an infection, that is the infection that we think about. So the incidence uh, has been increasing uh, due to HIV, also influx of immigrants from endemic regions uh, can all increase the incidence of tuberculosis. Populations at risk, I've listed them here. Any underlying uh, immunological problem, uh, the homeless population, prisoners, immunosuppression. Interestingly, post-gastrectomy also can increase susceptibility for tuberculosis. So these are populations that are at risk. And of course, we do have a TB center here in Newark, so we see a lot of cases. Somebody have a question? No. no? Okay. So the terms that you need to be familiar with when we're discussing tuberculosis, you have to be familiar with these terms. Primary tuberculosis, progressive primary tuberculosis, reactivation, post-primary, secondary, people tend to treat those terms synonymously, although they're not really synonymous. And then miliary tuberculosis. So these are these are terms that you need to be familiar with when we're talking about tuberculosis. So it turns out when people are exposed to tuberculosis, in 70% of cases, nothing happens. But in 30%, the patients can develop a primary infection. And in those cases of primary infection, a small percentage can go on to progressive primary disease where the disease progresses. But the vast majority of the disease is contained and in that vast majority, a vast majority of that, there is continued containment of disease. So most patients exposed to TB, nothing happens. And the only evidence you have that they've been exposed to TB is a, is a positive PPD test or other tests looking for evidence of exposure to tuberculosis. But a small percentage of these cases can have reactivation of what was once dormant disease later on in their lives. Right? So that actually affects a very small percentage of patients exposed to TB, but because so many people can be exposed to tuberculosis, it's not unusual for us to see cases of tuberculosis and active tuberculosis here in Newark. And we will see a lot of cases of people with positive PPDs who have negative chest radiographs because in most cases, that's what happens. Okay. So, what happens with TB is that patients can develop a localized pneumonitis when the organisms are inhaled. The organisms survive despite phagocytosis by macrophages, and they're carried to lymph nodes via the lymphatics, and they enter the bloodstream. So this is why we can get changes in the lymph nodes. And the mycobacteria themselves can be deposited all over the body, within lymph nodes, kidneys, epiphyses of long bones, lungs, vertebral bodies, even the brain which is why many years later, after exposure to TB, patients can have abscesses in, uh, in the spine, they can have abscesses in the brain, uh, in the long bones, and also disease within the kidneys. So the severity of disease is related to the strength of the immune response. If the cell-mediated immunity is strong and competent, the original focus and disseminated disease is completely eradicated, and the only evidence you have is enhanced memory for TB antigen. If less, with a less vigorous response, the disseminated disease is viable but walled off and can reactivate later on in the patient's life. And remember that with tuberculosis, the destruction and the scarring that we see within the tissues uh, is because of a hypersensitivity reaction to the tuberculous antigen itself and is not because the organism itself is destroying the tissues. If some mediated immunity is impaired, then patients after exposure can develop progressive primary tuberculosis. And then if you get hematogenous dissemination, you can have miliary tuberculosis. Now the traditional teaching on TB was that primary TB will give you lymphadenopathy and reactivation tuberculosis 
gives you fibrocavitary disease in an upper load distribution. Okay? Is this correct? Is this traditional teaching correct? No. So what determines then the radiographic appearance of tuberculosis that we see, the different patterns that see that these are two distinct patterns that we can see with tuberculosis. So what is going to determine which pattern that we see? Is it, so the traditional teaching was it's when the patient was infected. If the patient is infected and it's early disease, then you get lymphadenopathy. If it's reactivation disease, many years later you get fibrocavitary changes. So what's the answer? Yes, yeah, so it's the immunocompetence of the patient, regardless of when the infection occurred, that determines the pattern that we see on the chest radiograph. And so there's a very nice article that kind of discusses all of this. So some definitions, primary TB is disease within one year of initial infection. Reactivation TB is activation of all previously latent infection greater than one year since exposure. Now, how can we differentiate this um, whether it's primary or reactivation, well, there's DNA fingerprinting of tuberculous strains. So when there are people with tuberculosis, if we find genetically identical strains of TB clustered in two or more patients, then we can consider that primary infection as it's being spread from one patient to another. But if a patient presents with a unique strain, um, then that most likely represents reactivation TB, that's, that's tuberculosis that the patient was exposed to before in their life, and now has reactivation. So the, radi the radiographic appearance then does not depend on the time since infection, but on the immune status of the patient. So upper lobe cavitary disease, we will see that pattern with immunocompetent patients regardless of when they were infected. So somebody can have an initial infection with TB and can develop upper lobe cavitary disease. Uh, this lower zone disease, adenopathy effusion, that is associated with an immunocompromised host. So there, there is no difference, uh, radiographic difference, between true primary TB and reactivation TB. The pattern that we see is related to uh, the immune competence of the patient. So the immunocompromised host will have lymphadenopathy um, without much parenchymal disease, and the immunocompetent host is more likely to have parenchymal disease, especially in that upper lobe fibrocavitary pattern that we associate with tuberculosis. So for immunocompromised host, the three predominant radiologic findings, consolidation, adenopathy, pleural effusion, any of those three, any combination of those three, we can see uh, in these patients. So TB, we, you know, for pleural effusion, for unexplained pleural effusion, for unexplained lymphadenopathy, we can include tuberculosis in our differential diagnosis. For the and alveolar consolidation, again, without much cavitation, without much fibrotic change. So this we can also see uh, in these patients. So the infiltrates are chronic, rarely cavitate, require weeks or months to clear. So consolidations in children can be secondary to obstructive atelectasis from enlarged lymph nodes. With children, they have smaller airways. It's very easy to obstruct those airways with hyalur uh, lymphadenopathy. So uh, the opacity in children, especially in very young children, might be due to atelectasis of an obstructed, from an obstructed airway. So here you see one month later, you know, the consolidation does not change that much. So TB also belongs in your differential diagnosis of patients with chronic airspace disease, chronic consolidations. Lymphadenopathy, we can have enlarged hyalur or mediastinal nodes. The most common nodes are right paratracheal and right hyalur. Here's the prior chest radiograph. You can see a very nice right paratracheal line. On this patient here, no paratracheal line, but we can see the widening of the paratracheal stripe representing right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So of course, we can see that with tuberculosis. Prevalence of adenopathy decreases with age. Younger patients are more likely to have adenopathy. Older patients less likely to have lymphadenopathy secondary to infection with tuberculosis. Now, there can be a, an appearance of TB that can be characteristic of lymphadenopathy. So what's characteristic about the appearance? Yeah, so hypodensity, look, you know, looking necrotic with peripheral enhancement, and also the obliteration of the fat planes. Notice that the fat planes around the nodes are kind of obliterated from the inflammatory reaction. 
So these hypodense nodes with peripheral enhancement, so that can be a characteristic appearance with tuberculosis. What metastatic tumor can also do this? Central low attenuation and peripheral enhancement. What, what tumor can do this when it metastasizes? What cell type of tumor? You're very likely to see this on your head and neck cases when you're in neuro. Squamous cell cancer, yeah, and it can also happen in the lungs. So squamous cell cancer can also give you peripheral enhancement in these, these areas of central low attenuation, okay? So central low attenuation, peripheral enhancement, obliteration of perinodal fat, these appearances can be typical of tuberculosis. What is it that I'm showing you here? Yeah, so this is a ranking complex. So your definition of a ranking complex is what? Yeah, so the gold focus is the focus of infection in the lung that, that can be a calcified granuloma, as we see here. And so the ranking complex is, a, is that combined with abnormality within the lymph node. The most common abnormality that we see, especially with prior cases, is calcification within the lymph nodes. So the, co the combination of those two we call a ranking complex. So the gold focus is the site of initial infection in the lung, and that can heal with the calcified granuloma, the ranking complex is a combination of that and an, and an abnormal lymph node, either enlarged lymph node or calcified lymph node. So that is a ranking complex, okay? Pleural effusion, this we can also see as a manifestation of infection from tuberculosis, from hypersensitivity response, usually occurs on the same site as parenchymal disease, can be unilateral, but this also belongs in your differential diagnosis of an unexplained pleural effusion, especially in a young person you can include tuberculosis. Um, this case, very large pleural effusion here, complete atelectasis of the underlying lung. This was from tuberculosis. And it may take a while for them to arrive at the diagnosis. Even after thoracentesis, it takes a long time for the cultures to come back positive. But it is, in, it is important that you mention that in your differential for an unexplained pleural effusion, okay, in the patient. It might be the only finding in 5% of adult cases is a pleural effusion from tuberculosis. Now, when a disease progresses, we can uh, develop a cavitary disease, fibrotic disease, typically in an upper lung distribution. Uh, so this progressive primary TB is more common in adolescents and young adults and usually gives you upper lobe cavitary disease. When we have this kind of upper lobe fibrotic disease, there besides TB, there are other things that are also entered into the differential diagnosis. What's the differential diagnosis for upper lobe fibrotic disease? Yeah, so how can you differentiate sarcoid from tuberculosis? Is there anything different in the radiologic appearance of sarcoid versus TB? Sure. So, the, so the, probably the most important thing is sarcoid tends to be symmetric in terms of the disease that you get in the upper lobe. So sarcoid tends to be symmetric, TB tends to be asymmetric. Also, whenever you have bilateral hyalolymphadenopathy, if you have symmetric bilateral hyalolymphadenopathy, regardless of what else you see on the chest x-ray, always think about sarcoid in your differential diagnosis. So besides sarcoid, what are other diseases that can give us upper lobe fibrotic disease? Which one? Yeah, so silicosis, co-workers and meconiosis can be the upper lobe. But you mentioned fungal, fungal infection, right? So fungal infections can give you... By the way, which particular one would you think about? Well, we don't... Yeah, histo can do it. We don't see much histo around here. What, what fungal infection might you think about? Yeah, aspergillosis. We do see some cases of chronic aspergillosis. So cases of chronic aspergillosis can look just like tuberculosis with this upper lobe fibrotic disease and can be cavitary also. Now there's, a, there's another topic that we're going to get into later on in the lecture uh, that can also look like TB, give you upper lobe fibrotic disease. What is that? Typical Atypical mycobacterial infection, right. So these are all things that might be in your differential for somebody who has upper lobe fibrotic disease, okay? So those are other things in your differential. So the risk of reactivation is greatest in the first two years after infection. And then these are some of the things that, 
might predispose and increase the risk of reactivation of tuberculosis. So findings associated with TB in the immunocombinant host, they're, they're listed here. We'll talk about what some of these are. So the parenchymal changes occur predominantly in apical and posterior segments of the lung. And it's thought that the, 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 the current theory as to why this occurs is that it's, it's thought to be related to the lymphatic drainage from these regions. Uh, is that lymphatic drainage is more efficient within the lower lungs and the anterior portions of the lungs because of the pumping action of the ribs when, when you breathe so that that acts as a pump for the uh, lymphatic system. And so the antigens that are cleared from the lower lungs and the anterior portions of the lungs better than they are from the upper portions of the lungs. And so the TB antigens accumulate there. And so that's why you will get the disease, the fibrocavitating changes more often occur within the upper portions of the, of the lungs. Now, this theory of lymphatic clearance, you can also push to other diseases, right? Because they're what pneumoconiosis can give you upper lung fibrotic disease? Silicosis and coworkers pneumoconiosis. So maybe the lymphatics have a role to play there also, clearing the particles from those regions better. And so that's why we get the fibrotic disease there. Another disease that, that uh, we associate with upper lung fibrotic disease is? Well, cystic fibrosis uh, is really bronchiectasis, right? So what we're looking at is bronchiectasis. So that's something different. But what's another disease that we mentioned earlier that gives you upper lung fibrotic disease? Sarcoid, yeah. And one of the theories as to the etiology for sarcoid is what? It's a reaction to an unknown antigen. Right? So that's one of the theories that's out there for sarcoid. So we can, so maybe that explains why sarcoid, also the fibrotic changes for sarcoid, tends to be upper lung predominant. Okay. So this fibrocavitary disease with cavitation, a very typical appearance for tuberculosis, and of course, whenever we see that, we're always going to consider tuberculosis. So if you see this in an ER patient, what's the first thing you're going to do? Yes, you're going to call them and tell them to isolate the patient because we're worried about active tuberculosis in a patient like this, and so this patient is contagious. So it's very important that the patient be isolated if we see cavitary changes on the chest radiograph. So we'll see volume loss, retraction of hyla, dystrophic calcifications, bronchiectasis from scarring, traction bronchiectasis. That accounts for many of these cystic areas that we see on the chest radiograph. What's different about this chest radiograph. What are the findings here? So here, yeah, so here you do have a cavitary lesion here in the right upper lobe, but we also have nodules here uh, within the lungs. So with nodules, whenever we say tuberculosis with nodules in the lungs, the first thing you think about is miliary TB, right? Is this miliary TB? Ah, okay, so you, so let, let's see if we can fool somebody else. So why, how, why is this not miliary TB? Yeah, so the nodules are too big, right? So in miliary TB, the nodules are really small. So these, these are larger nodules, right? So if we have a patient with cavitary disease and tuberculosis, what explains then this nodular pattern that we have with, with TB? So what's it? Give somebody else a chance. Smaller. So what's it's happening? Like, um, so what's happening? Is it inflammation of the small airways? Like the treatment? Right, but how's it, how's it getting? It's bronchogenic dissemination. Okay. Especially if you have a cavitary lesion. If you have a cavitary lesion, then you have access, the organism has access to the airways. And so you get bronchogenic dissemination. It's, it's the bronchogenic dissemination that gives you these kind of larger nodules. By the way, there's a term for nodules that you get with bronchogenic dissemination. What's the term? Do you know this, Jose? You do not. Anybody? These are called asiner nodules. These are called asiner nodules, right? So whenever you have nodules from bronchogenic dissemination of disease, they're called asiner nodules. Okay? So 
you get these ill-defined nodules. They're larger than the nodules that you would see with biliary disease. They're called acid or nodules. And of tree and bud, the classic appearance from bronchogenic dissemination of disease. You get these branching opacities. These are central lobular. Notice that they are not touching the pleural surfaces. We have these central lobular nodules branching. That is a tree and bud pattern. TB is the classic thing. But any anytime you get bronchogenic dissemination of infection, you can have tree and bud nodules. Any bronchiolitis can give you tree and bud nodules. But always think about TB and also atypical mycobacteria when we see tree and bud nodules. Okay? Here's a nice example where we have cavitation and tree and bud, right? So cavitation with tree and bud. So of course TB is going to be the first thing to think about if we see something like that. Another very nice example of tree and bud nodules from tuberculosis. So this, this is bronchogenic dissemination of disease. Okay? Now, some patients with TB might develop larger nodules like this. There's a term for nodules like this from tuberculosis. We call these tuberculomas, right? So these are called tuberculomas when you have larger nodules from tuberculosis. So these can contain active or, you know, living organisms. So these are tumor-like foci of TB, okay? And so this, these can get bigger. These, these might progress over time. These might calcify. So there's an example with calcification of tuberculoma. Uh, you can have central calcification. You can have a caseous core. You may also have small satellite nodules. And as we've said, these might grow slowly. We can also see pleural disease with tuberculosis. We can have apical pleural thickening. So this is very common uh, with tuberculosis. It could also it can also affect the costophrenic angles. So thickening in the costophrenic angles. But this apical pleural thickening is very common. In many cases, it's not actually pleural thickening. But what this represents is because of the fibrosis within the upper lobes, the lung contracts down. And then you have extra pleural fat that comes down to fill the space. So here it is here. So here's the lung that's kind of collapsing down from the scarring. And then what we see is the pleural thickening is this extra pleural fat that comes down and fills the space. So if you look for this extra pleural fat, if you see extra pleural fat like that within the apex of the lung, so it's an indication that there's been loss of volume within that lobe. And you have the extra pleural fat now coming down to fill the space. And that's going to look like pleural thickening on your chest radiograph. That's going to give you the appearance of apical pleural thickening. All right, so the finding on this chest radiograph is yeah, might be calcified. And it doesn't get better than this. So you have pretty extensive pleural thickening with pleural calcification. And what about the volume of the lung on that side? Yeah, so the lung is decreased in volume on that side, right? So we have extensive pleural thickening with pleural calcification. So there's a term for this appearance. What is the term? Fibrothorax. Fibrothorax, right. So when we have extensive pleural scarring, pleural calcification, and pleural thickening, that actually results in uh, this decrease in the lung volume, and this will affect uh, the physiological function of that lung. It's decreased in volume. The ventilation of it is also impaired. So this is a patient with a fibrothorax. Okay, so we have severe pleural thickening with pleural calcification. Now, there is a differential for pleural calcification. What is the differential for pleural calcification? Asbestosis. Not asbestosis. No. What is the definition of asbestosis? Who can tell me the definition of asbestosis? Nobody? Jose, are you on this one? <laughs> no, what's the definition of asbestosis? You got to know this. This is not hard. Asbestosis is fibrotic disease where? In the lung parenchyma. In the lung parenchyma. So asbestosis is fibrotic disease in the lung parenchyma. You get traction, bronchiectasis, honeycomb, and interstitial disease in the lung parenchyma. When asbestos exposure gives you disease in the pleural space or in the pleura, right, we call that asbestos exposure or asbestos-related pleural disease. So you do not say asbestosis for this. 
Of course, you might look for evidence of asbestosis, right? You might look for disease uh, if you're thinking about it uh, in the lump brain lump, but that is not plural calcification. But asbestos exposure, asbestos-related plural disease can give you plural calcification. It can give you pleural effusion, so certainly that might be in your differential for a case like this. What else? So chronic empyema, yes, chronic empyema also can give you pleural calcification and a contained pleural collection like you see here. And this was chronic empyema from tuberculosis. So TB can do this. It's very common for TB to do this, right? So on thoracentesis, this patient had viable organisms within that collection. So chronic empyema, especially from tuberculosis, is also in your differential. What else? Yeah, so top pleurodesis can give you high attenuation particles within the pleural space, although that looks a little different than this. So the talc tends to be more granular. So that has a somewhat different appearance, but that can give you high attenuation particles, which might look like calcifications within the pleural space. What else? What? What pleural metastatic disease gives you pleural calcification? You might find a case report or something, but I'm not aware. I'm not aware of that as any kind of uh, a, a typical appearance of, of a metastatic disease to the pleura. Okay. What if the patient had a motor vehicle accident ten years ago? Yeah, a chronic organizing hemothorax. So a hemothorax can also organize. So the blood can give you a chronic collection and the pleura around it, you can have calcification. So chronic organizing hemothorax is also in your differential. Okay, it's very unusual, but it is in the differential. All right, so pleural disease, not unusual with tuberculosis. So you can have loculated effusions, you can have pleural calcification. It can be stable for many years but it may contain viable organisms, right? So that belongs in our differential. Miliary TB, very tiny nodules, right? So this is from hematogenous dissemination of disease. So here we get very tiny nodules. I used to think that people with miliary TB would be very sick. That is not the case. People can walk around with miliary TB. So if you're looking at a chest X-ray with these tiny small nodules, make sure you think about miliary TB. Call the clinician, hey, we've got to check this out for miliary tuberculosis, all right? Initially, the radiographs may be normal. Lesions may not be visible until three to six weeks after hematogenous dissemination. So patients can walk around with miliary TB. So make sure that you think about this. So we will have multiple small nodules. In 30% of cases, other findings, consolidations, cavitation, calcified nodes, lymphadenopathy, but in many cases, you may not have those other findings. So that's why you need to think about Miliary TB when you have these tiny nodules. And of course, it's going to give you what kind of distribution? Random, random distribution. The hematogenous dissemination, we will get a random distribution of nodules on CT. We get this a lot. History of PPD positive, they want an assessment of activity. The phrase, which I've gone and over with you guys so many times, the phrase on a negative chest x ray that they looking for, what is the phrase? No radiographic evidence of active pulmonary tuberculosis. All right, can we get that straight? Okay, that is the phrase they're looking for in the impression when you have a case of PPD positive and we're looking at the chest radiograph. Now, when we're looking at this chest radiograph, if we have no prior studies. Is that the phrase we can we can or we are allowed to put in the impression? Why not? There is a calcified granuloma here, right? So now technically speaking, right? Probabilistically, this is probably old disease. There's probably nothing wrong with this patient, but if this is the only chest x-ray that we have. It is conceivable that this patient might have active disease. So what I usually say is, you know, I don't put that impression in the report. I will say there's a calcified granuloma that may be from prior exposure to tuberculosis, but 
Technically speaking, if you're asked on an exam, if there is any finding that can be related to tuberculosis, you know, any abnormality, um, you can't use that phrase unless you have a prior chest radiograph that shows there's no change. Now, if the chest radiograph is negative, there's a very high negative predictive value for active TB. And, you know, competent adults, won't, only a 1% false negative rate. You do have to be careful with HIV positive patients. They can have negative chest radiographs and they might still have active disease. A single screening chest x-ray with, with any abnormality that might be related to TB must be interpreted as indeterminate for activity of tuberculosis. Don't, you know, don't say active disease, right? That, that's something completely different. But realize that technically speaking, unless we have priors, it's indeterminate. Even after therapy, patients will have changes. So here you have the fibrocavitary disease, upper lobe, retraction of hilum. After therapy, we still have these interstitial changes that are left, be, that are left behind. If there are abnormalities on the chest radiograph, there are cutoff is six months, right? So we, we call it, if it's unchanged over six months on radiograph, we call it radiographically stable. Right? So that's radiographically stable over six months. It's unlikely for it to be active, although theoretically it is still possible, but we call it radiographically stable. Um, now, even TB foci that remain inactive might still contain viable organisms. Cavitation and miliary disease on chest x-ray indicate active disease. So if we see cavitation, we're going to tell them to in the ER, isolate. isolate. That is a question that has come up on the exam. You know, they'll ask you, and you're supposed to know to tell them to isolate the patient because it indicates increased risk of transmission. Of it. Thoracic complications of TB from the extensive scarring, patients can develop pretty large cystic spaces like this from the scarring associated with tuberculosis. Uh, not for you, Jose, give somebody else a chance. For what complication of TB is illustrated here? All right, Jose. <laughs> what is this called? Yeah, how functional is the left lung? None. It's completely destroyed. It's collapsed. It's completely collapsed. This is called autonumenectomy, all right? When the lung is completely fibrosed down and destroyed and non-functional, right? This is scarred down. All of this is extra pleural fat. This is called autonumenectomy, complete lung destruction from TB, autonumenectomy, okay? All right, what complication from TB is this? Yeah, so aspergillomas can grow in pre-existing cavities, so TB is a common cause of these pre-existing cavities, and so we can have aspergillomas that grow. Fungus balls can grow within those cavities. That is an aspergilloma, right? growing in a pre-existing cavity. Bronchogenic cancer, anybody with fibrotic lung disease is at increased risk for bronchogenic cancer, so theoretically, these patients are also at increased risk for lung cancer. Airway complications, we have some airway complications associated with TB, of course, traction bronchiectasis from the scarring. We can always see that with tuberculosis. So here, notice the hilum is elevated, elevation of the hilum, always a good sign of volume loss here. These reticular opacities represent scarring. And then here on the CT, you can see the traction bronchiectasis and this lobe here is decreased in volume. That's the right upper lobe that is scarred down. Notice the esophagus is shifted towards that side. That also is a common appearance when we have scarring and volume loss in the upper lobes from TB is to see the esophagus shifted towards that side. And then retraction bronchiectasis, so here's the volume loss. Look at the minor fissure here and all of this volume loss there in the right upper lobe. Stenosis of airways, we can see that from scarring of the airways. So so scarring of the airways can also give us stenosis. Illustrated here is a very nice, uh, very unusual, but nice complication of TB. What, what complication is this? It's a Rasmussen aneurysm. No. No, it is not. Bronchomethiasis, yes. So these are calcified lymph nodes, right? And so what's happening here is atelectasis from lymph nodes eroding into the airways, causing atelectasis uh, peripheral to that, right? So this is called bronchomethiasis when we have lymph nodes that erode into the airways, causing obstruction of the airways. These are calcified nodes.
So that is broncholithiasis. What complication? <laughs> Rasmussen aneurysm. This is a Rasmussen aneurysm, right. So here you have this very large, really pseudo aneurysm, right, of a, usually a pulmonary artery branch. So that is a Rasmussen aneurysm. So these tend to occur near the walls of cavities as it erodes into the uh, pulmonary artery and causes aneurysm or really pseudo aneurysm formation within them. And of course, hemorrhage, life threatening hemorrhage, is a complication of this. That is a Rasmussen aneurysm. So there are various vascular <coughs> complications that we can also see with TB. Um, yeah. No, it's not. It's it's not necessarily active TB. So it's the rest of the lung. You know what's going on in the rest of the lung that would tell you if it's active TB. Okay. So, bronchial artery dilatation, whenever you have fibrotic disease in the lungs, from regardless of the cause, you can have hypertrophy of the bronchial arteries. And you get these, this neovascularization to the fibrotic lung. You see all these small branches. So this neovascularization, this hypertrophy of the bronchial arteries is a risk of hemorrhage. Remember, these arteries are under systemic pressure. So the hemorrhage here is going to be worse than hemorrhage that you would get from pulmonary artery branches. So bronchial artery dilatation that can result in life-threatening hemorrhage, this is also a complication of tuberculosis. We talked about Rasmussen aneurysm, usually a pulmonary artery branch, tends to occur next to a lung that is infected with TB. We can have complications within the mediastinum from tuberculosis, of course, lymph nodes, here it goes on to develop lower attenuation and calcification here within the lymph nodes from therapy. So we can see lymph nodes starting out as low attenuation going on to develop calcification. This we can see occasionally. So lymph nodes, uh, the lymph adenomy can actually erode into the esophagus. And so you get these esophageal mediastinal fistulas. So here you can see communication of the esophagus and the mediastinum. So this was a case that we had last year. So um, on the CT scan here, you have these enlarged lymph nodes, okay? And you have some funny air collections there. So the question was, is there communication with the esophagus? So whenever you're looking for any kind of esophageal leak, it's always important to do a non-contrast CT first just to see what is there. Right? especially if you have a case of TB where you can have calcifications, and then it's going to be difficult to differentiate calcifications from contrast. In this particular case, you can see what the non-contrast looks like, but after we give contrast, there's a little bit of that oral contrast that is actually leaked out from the esophagus into the mediastinum. So this patient had an esophageal mediastinal fistula. Okay. Fibrosing mediastinitis. This can occur from tuberculosis, although the most the, the infection that is most closely associated with fibrosing mediastinitis is what? Histoplasmosis is the infection that is most closely associated with fibrosing mediastinitis, but we can get that with histoplasmosis. What complication of TB is illustrated here? Yeah, so the complication would be well, pericardial calcification is associated with, I can't hear you, what? Constrictive pericarditis, right. Constrictive pericarditis. Worldwide, TB is a common cause of constrictive pericarditis, not so much in the United States, but worldwide it is a common cause of constrictive pericarditis. So, uh, interesting complication here, this chyloform or pseudochylus pleural effusion, which we'll also talk about in a little bit. Chronic empyema, whenever we have pleural calcification associated with the collection, <coughs> chronic empyema is in your differential diagnosis there. Fibrothorax, we talked about that already, right? So pleural scarring that results in loss of volume in the lung as it constricts the lung on the side. What complication of TB is illustrated here? Well, what do you have here in the pleural space? You have 
Yeah, you have a large collection with an air fluid level, right? Whenever we see that in somebody with disease in the lung, you're going to think about bronchopleural fistula. More likely it's a bronchoalveolar fistula where the communication is with the air spaces, but we, you know, we call them bronchopleural fistulas, right? So whenever we have air fluid levels like that uh, within the pleural space, you know, assuming no intervention, no trauma with lung disease, think about bronchopleural fistula. Usually, you don't actually image the fistulous communication. It's pretty unusual to actually do that on CT. In many cases, it closes spontaneously. Sometimes you might, though, as in this case. So bronchopleural fistula can be a complication from TB. This chyliform or pseudochylous pleural effusion is a very interesting. So what happens here is this is a complication of TB from the chronic empyema. The white cells die. And when they die, the lipid there accumulates and kind of floats to the top of the collection. And sometimes milk of calcium forms, which can also fall to the dependent portion of the collection. So if they tap this, it, it, uh, it looks like, uh, you know, chylus fluid. Uh, it looks like lymphatic fluid, but it really isn't lymphatic fluid. So that's why it's called a pseudochylus or chyliform pleural effusion, okay? Not a chylus pleural effusion, but chyliform or pseudochylus. And you can have milk of calcium that falls to the dependent area when it turns the patient prone and goes to the other side. And that fat that's kind of layering at the top of it is the key that you're dealing with a chyliform pleural effusion. This patient has chest pain radiating to the back. When you look at the current chest radiograph and compare that to the chest radiograph from four years prior, what looks different? Yes, yeah, so this, this border in here is what? Yeah, so that is the right heart border. So that's the right heart border there, okay? When, when we go past that, there's this bulging on the right side. Is there any bulging on the left side? Yeah, there is. Right? So the compartment would be... What compartment? Posterior mediastinum, right? So you have bulging of the paravertebral lines. We think of the posterior mediastinum and an electron TB, the complication would be ascitis with paraspinal abscess. Right? So four years prior, you look at the contours of the mediastinum. Now we have bulging here of the paraspinal line. This is the descent of the aorta. So then here we have a paraspinal abscess with discitis and osteomyelitis in this particular patient. So that, of course, is a complication of tuberculosis also. This guy is osteomyelitis. Uh, what complication of TB is illustrated here? Empyema necessitans. Yeah, so empyema necessitans, when the empyema breaks through the chest wall into the subcutaneous tissue. So when empyema breaks through the chest wall, it's called empyema necessitans. Right? So that can occur. So these are various chest wall complications of TB, and here is empyema necessitans, okay? We talked about TB spondylitis already, the infections and the paraspinal abscesses that can occur with TB. So let's move on now to non-tuberculous mycobacteria. What do we have to know about this? No human-to-human -human transmission. The organisms are found in the environment. These are the organisms. Here it's very difficult to separate these two, so they're grouped together as mycobacterium avium intracellulare or MAC complex. These here are rapid growers, and we'll talk about what, the, what infection or what situation that is associated with also in a little bit. Criteria for diagnosis, cavitation or progressive disease on chest radiograph, at least two positive sputum cultures, or evidence of mycobacterium lung biopsy or positive BAL. It is a difficult diagnosis to make. This is not an easy diagnosis. To make. There are various patterns that are associated with atypical mycobacterial infection. So we talk about the various patterns. This particular pattern is called, well, what's the finding? Yeah, not just right upper lobe, but also left upper lobe, right? So you have upper lobe fibrocavitary disease or upper lobe fibrotic disease that looks like tuberculosis. tuberculosis, right? So this particular pattern is called 
classic, this is called the, the classic pattern, right? It's kind of the most common. Usually elderly males, especially associated with COPD, it looks like tuberculosis. They can have tree and bud opacities, they can have cavitation. Many times we're looking at emphysematous disease here with the upper lobe. So this is called classical disease. Uh, first type described, therefore classic, MKITS, SI, and MAC. Um, so we see it in immunocompetent patients. They can have chronic infection, can go on for months or years, usually progresses slowly. It does not progress as fast as tuberculosis. Underlying disease, COPD is the most common underlying disease, tends to be associated or we see this usually in elderly males. All right, so this is called classical disease and it looks just like tuberculosis with that upper lobe distribution of fibrosis and cavitary disease. All right, so looks like TB, you can have bronchogenic spread, you can have tree and bud nodules, but this can also be in your differential. If you have something that looks like TB, but for some reason is not TB. Okay. So cavities, tree and bud nodules, we can see that. It tends to be resistant to treatment and recurrence of disease is very common, very hard disease to treat. If we have chronic cough, right, we have a chest radiograph that looks like this, um, you can tell from the lateral where the disease is. Where's the disease? Yeah, so middle lobe, right, over here is a, looks like that's middle lobe disease whenever it for superimposed like that over the heart. So when you have disease superimposed on the heart, we think of middle lobe and lingula, right? So on the CT scan, we see that the disease really affecting there, the right middle lobe, Predominantly. So when you see that pattern of involvement, involvement of the right middle lobe and lingula specifically, or the disease is, is you know, worse in that distribution, what do we think of here? So this is Lady Windermere's syndrome, and the, the other term for this is non-classical disease. All right, so right middle lobe lingula, this tends to affect elderly, elderly women. So again, it can be immunocompromised patients, Lady Windermere syndrome, no predisposing lung disease, right middle lobe lingula. They can get bronchiectasis, nodules within those areas. Other parts of the lung can also be affected, but the right middle lobe and lingula tends to be the most severely affected regions of the lungs when we see that. So right middle lobe and lingula disease with <coughs> bronchiectasis, tremor nodules, that's Lady Windermere syndrome. You can also have multiple nodules. So atypical mycobacteria can give you multiple nodules. So very commonly mistaken for cancer or metastatic diseases can also give you false positive PET scan findings. They go and they resect the nodule and it comes back not as cancer, but as atypical mycobacterial disease. So that can also occur, asymptomatic nodules. That's a pattern that we can also see, that we can also see with atypical mycobacterial infections. So asymptomatic nodules, right? They might be, you know, have these funny looking borders, whereas METs tend to have more well-defined rounded borders that might help. You do need to recognize this if you see this on a chest radiograph. So what is it that I am showing you here on this chest radiograph that you need to be able to recognize? So what is it, I guarantee you, this is fair game to show you this on the exam and to expect you to recognize it. What is it? What am I showing you? No, no, and no. So first of all, what is this? That's the right atrial board. What is this? Okay, and what is this here? Well, you tell me, right? So, so what is that? Fluid level? That's an air fluid level. So it's achalasia. This is achalasia. You need to recognize this on the chest radiograph, right? So when you have an opacity that's coming all the way down, this can be very sneaky on the frontal view. You look at this and you go, oh my God, what's going on? The lateral view, notice the trachea is bowed anteriorly, right? The trachea is bowed anteriorly. What lives behind the trachea? Soft tissue. 
the esophagus that extends all the way down, and your bonus, your nice bonus, is this air fluid level, right? So this is somebody with achalasia. If we're talking about atypical mycobacteria with achalasia, what are we talking about here? Nice. Right, mycobacteria fortuitum. This tends to grow within the esophagus, and it can be easily aspirated, as you can imagine, because of the achalasia. So these patients will have the lung disease. So associated with achalasia, mycobacterium fortuitum, colonia complex, these are rapid growers. The cultures come back faster. So they can have lung disease in patients with achalasia. This organism can grow within the esophagus of patients with achalasia. Patients who are HIV positive can also have root fat enopathy from atypical mycobacterial infection. They don't have to have lung disease. They can just have lymphadenopathy. It doesn't always have to be within the chest. It can also be within the abdomen. They can also have enlarged abdominal lymph nodes. So disseminated disease in patients who are HIV positive with AIDS, lymphadenopathy is another pattern that can be seen with atypical mycobacterial infection, usually no pulmonary symptoms. So we can see lymphadenopathy in these cases. Sometimes you can have low attenuation nodes, just like tuberculosis in patients with AIDS. So we can, we can see this with atypical mycobacterial infection. Okay. Now, if I tell you this patient is short of breath, the finding here on the CT, what are, what are some of the findings here on CT? Central yeah, you have these central ovular kind of areas of ground glass opacity, and then here we have these areas that are somewhat <coughs> more low in attenuation, right? So what, what underlying condition can give you central ovular ground glass opacities with hair trapping and mosaic attenuation? Hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, right. And if we're talking about atypical mycobacterial disease that gives you a pattern of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, what is it that we're talking about here? What is this? Hot tub. This is hot tub lung. So it can grow within the hot tubs and the aerosolized uh, Jets from the hot tubs allows it to penetrate into the lung, and the patients can develop a hypersensitivity pneumonitis like reaction. On expiratory views, you can see air trapping because of the inflammation around the small airways. So that is called hot tub lung, central ovular ground glass nodules, hypersensitivity pneumonitis from inhaled MAC. Okay? So the different patterns, classical form of infection looks like TB, who gets that? Elderly males with COPD, non-classical disease, the other term is Lady Windermere syndrome, it affects right middle lobe lingula and elderly women, right? Asymptomatic nodules, of course, can affect anybody. Disseminated infection and AIDS, the finding there would be lymphadenopathy. <clears throat> Achalasia associated infection, that is yeah, the rapid growers, mycobacterium fortuitum. In hypersensitivity pneumonitis pattern, we call that associated with MAC hot tub lung. Okay? All right, so that's it for today. Next time there will be a quiz. Any questions? <coughs>